So I'm currently working through uh, Tom, or excuse me, the, the Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Uh, if you have not read this book in a while, uh, it's, it's a fantastic book. And one of the things uh, that I'm convinced of from this book particularly uh, that makes Mark Twain one of the greatest American authors of all time is his ability to develop characters in his stories. I mean, the, story, the, the characters in the story of, Mark, or in the story of Tom Sawyer uh, are incredibly well-developed. They are easy to know, right? They're knowable, they are relatable, and they're absolutely believable. You have these different characters outside of Tom himself, uh, such as uh, Aunt Polly, right, who tirelessly loves Tom. She does everything for him. Uh, She seeks to discipline him well, seeks to guide him spiritually, and is at all times exhausted by him, right? So I think as mothers read this and say, oh my goodness, I think my child is a Tom Sawyer, because this is how I feel, constantly wanting to direct the path of these children, yet feeling exhausted. Then you have Huckleberry Finn. Huckleberry Finn lives the life that Tom wishes he could live right? Huck Finn lives carefree. He is outside of the social norms and the social rules. He loves to steal watermelons and chickens, and he loves to borrow boats and cigars, and he lives the life that every young boy wishes they could live, completely carefree. Then you have Tom's half-brother, Sid. Sid is an interesting character. He is the goody-goody in the story. He loves getting Tom into trouble. But the thing with Sid is, though his behavior is always on point, he's a mean, mean-spirited little boy. In fact, what Twain does is he juxtaposes, contrasts Tom and Sid, right? Sid is mean-spirited but well-behaved. Tom is warm-hearted but behaves poorly, right? And as we read this story, we see these characters just developing before us, and it's, we feel like, man, we know these characters in this story. One of the reasons that Tom Sawyer is such a classic and has endured the test of time is because as we read it, we feel like Twain actually brings us into this story in a way that we belong. And the way he does that is through character development. Character development is key in understanding any good story. If you don't get the characters right, you will not get the story right. You have to get the characters in order to get the story. Now, the the Apostle John, likewise, is a fantastic storyteller. And he develops characters in in his gospel that are compelling, that are relatable, that are knowable. Throughout his gospel, he brings these different characters from the peripherals into the center stage and then moves them back out as they have accomplished their purpose in the story. We see this early on with John the Baptist, who shows up multiple times, entering and exiting from the center stage of John's story. And the the character of John the Baptist is the preeminent disciple. He is what it looks like to walk faithfully. He is what it looks like to fear God. He is what it looks like to submit to Christ. Then you have Peter, an aspiring John the Baptist character, who's rash and outspoken and is constantly tripping over himself. Uh, Yet ultimately, we see this redemption of Peter at the end of the gospel. We have other characters that move in and out of the story, such as the woman at the well or Nicodemus, serving their purpose, illustrating John's point, and then they exit the story quietly. One other thing that John does as he develops characters, he develops not only individuals, but he develops groups as characters. The disciples are a great example of this. We see Peter and John and Nathaniel and James, at times individually taking center stage, but the group of the disciples actually constitute a character in the story, and they are likewise to be understood as a group, as a character, to understand the story. Just in John chapter 6, we see the disciples going across the water when the storm arises, and how do the disciples respond? Absolutely terrified of the storm, right? Fear grips them, and this is a fear that grips this character that is the disciples in the story. Another group of people that make an important character in this story is a group of the Jewish leaders or the crowds. 
right? The crowds in John chapter 6 who are fed the loaves and the fish from the miraculous feeding of Jesus, the crowds respond as a character in this story. But out of this character comes another character, which is uh, the Jews, as Paul or as John calls them. The Jews are a very, very important character in John's story. They are typically made up as a group and usually Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees and those who are religious leaders kind of make up this group that is called the Jews. And this character is one that is developed throughout John's gospel. We see this character, the Jews, showing up in chapter 1, and they show up in just about every single chapter of John's gospel all the way to the end, except for the upper room discourse, which is just a few chapters uh, from uh, 13 to 17. But everywhere else, we see this character, the Jews, being on the scene. And it is not a flat or non-dynamic character, but rather very, very dynamic. The Jews are developing throughout this story. At times, it seems like the Jews are going to repent and follow Christ. At times, it seems like they want to listen to his teachings. It looks like they're going to follow him and obey him. And then at other times, we see them viscerally despising Jesus. We see them at times um, hating Jesus so much and in such conflict with Christ that they want to see him die. The character of the Jews, as Jesus calls them, uh, would be befitting to a son of the devil. They are, in fact, the great antagonist of this story. This character is one that stands opposed to Jesus throughout the story, and their, their insidious motivations actually increase from the early chapters all the way through to the end when they are screaming, crucify him, crucify him. Now, John's gospel is a very contentious gospel, particularly between this character and Jesus. They are constantly trying to catch Jesus, trick Jesus, and even kill Jesus. When we look at the interactions between Jesus and the Jews, it's kind of like the old cartoon, The Roadrunner which is another story that has fantastic character development as you really start to feel for the great villain, Wiley Coyote. This is one who is always one step behind the roadrunner. He can never quite capture him, though he is a self-proclaimed evil genius, yet never quite clever enough, never fast enough, never quite able to best the roadrunner. This is the sort of relationship Jesus has with the Jews in this gospel. They are always trying to catch him, yet always one step behind. Even at the cross, where they think that they have won because they finally nailed him to a cross, kind of like the anvil that drops on the, on the road runner, and we're waiting for the dust to settle to see, did he actually get him this time? As the dust settles in John's gospel, we see Jesus rising from the dead, being victorious over the enemy, and it's, in fact, the Jews who are now in condemnation in the grave. In John chapter 6, this character of the Jews steps on to center stage as the main antagonist to Jesus. And the rest of John 6 is this back and forth between Jesus and this group. Now, to give us a little background of where we are in chapter 6, the chapter began with Jesus feeding the 5,000. He crosses the sea, he feeds the 5,000 with the five loaves and the two fish, And it is a fantastically glorious miracle. And everybody is excited about this. So they're all praising Jesus, wanting to make him king, calling him a prophet, and so on. But Jesus knows what's in their hearts. He knows this character better than we do, right? He knows what kind of character this is. So what he does is he sends his disciples across the sea by themselves while he goes up onto the mountain to pray. And then a storm comes onto the sea as the disciples are in the boat, and they are terrified. They are fearful. This is their character in this part of the story. Jesus comes and walks on the water, meets them out there, and brings them to the shore after telling them, do not fear. He knows the character is a fearful character, and he calls them to not fear but to trust in him. So now Jesus and his disciples are on the other side of the lake. Meanwhile, the crowd is starting to get their morning appetite. They're getting hungry. The next day, they're looking for Jesus. Where is he? They can't find him. So out of this massive crowd, a group of them, not all of them, but a group of them go across the sea looking for Jesus. And this group that comes across is this character, the Jews, the ones that are pursuing Jesus, looking for him. 
And then they finally find him on the other side of the sea the next day. This is where our passage picks up. In John 6, 25, we have this character, this insidious, this wicked, evil character coming to Jesus and asking him a question. And this question is what leads to the bread of life discourse that we'll be in over the next couple weeks. So verse 25 of John 6 says this, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? When did you come here? This, this, word, this phrase can be translated in multiple ways. When did you come here? When did you get here? How long have you been here? Now, when we read this, we, we think to ourselves, oh, this is great. Here's a group of people looking for Jesus. They find him, and they refer to him in this honorific title, rabbi, right? Th- this is an innocent character. But to get the story, we have to get the character. It's so important that we understand the character that's asking this question. This question, though to our reading, seems like a fairly respectful question. They're looking for Jesus. But in fact, this is not how John intends it. This is actually a very sarcastic, pontious, kind of arrogant question. This is the sort of question that a bratty little girl would say to her father when he walks into the room and she kind of stomps her foot and says, well, where have you been? And the dad would look at the child and say, I don't have to answer that at all, right? That that sort of question, the way you just asked that is so disrespectful that, uh, and basically, who do you think you are that you get to ask me this question, right? Know your place. This is the sort of uh, posture that the Jews have when they ask this question. Rabbi, how long have you been here? When did you get here? So Jesus knowing that this question is dripping with deceit and arrogance off of their lips, is not all that interested in answering their question. In fact, we can see how ridiculous this question is because they refer to him as rabbi, which means teacher. Should be an honorific uh, title, right? Teacher, rabbi. But it's not because throughout the rest of this chapter, we have this character, this group, arguing, grumbling, and disputing Jesus with everything that he teaches right? They might call him teacher, but they're certainly not his students. They're not looking to learn from him. They are not submitting to his wisdom and to his guidance, but rather they have other motives in mind. So Jesus, knowing the heart of man, knowing this character, again, better than we do, responds to them in verse 26. It says that Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are not seeking me, or you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. He says this in the emphatic, this truly, truly, that means, hey, listen. He's speaking seriously. He's speaking intentionally to them. This is not a, oh, hey, thanks for uh, complimenting me. He's saying, no, you listen here. You're not looking for me because you saw the signs. You're looking for me because you ate your fill of the loaves. Don't rabbi me is basically what he's saying here. Don't, don't do that. He understands the heart of these people, and he understands that this question is one that he does not need to answer. They asked, where have you been? Jesus does not answer. He doesn't answer the question at all. What does he say? He says, you're seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill in the loaves. So he doesn't even answer their question. But what he, the way he answers is actually peeling back the layers of deceit on this character and revealing the true motives of their hearts, right? The true motives is not that you came looking for me because of what I have done. When you saw the signs, you were not impressed. You were not thinking, these are signs of the Messiah. These are signs of, of the coming king. These are signs that fulfill prophecy. They're not thinking that way. They're not seeking Jesus because he is the Christ. But why? Because you ate your fill of the loaves. Your belly is your God, basically. That's what you're seeking me for, to eat breakfast and to get it for free. So peeling back these layers is something that Jesus does in these two verses. And it's incredible to think about this because we are so often like this character, the Jews. We come to Jesus and we have layers over our true motivation. But here we see that Jesus is one who sees to the heart of man. He sees right to the core 
of who we are. When we approach the throne of our king in prayer, when we live our lives before his gaze, we must do so not with pretense, not with arrogance, not with self-assurity like this character, the Jews, but rather we are to do so with humility and honesty as we stand before his omniscience. We love to talk about the omniscience of God. He is all-knowing. We talk about the omnipresence of God, that he is everywhere at all times. We talk about the omnipotence of God, that he is all-powerful. And we love to hold up our God and praise him for that until we actually don't believe that at all because we think we can come into his presence and hide something from him. Right? We come into his presence concealing our motives, thinking that, well, maybe if I phrase it this way, Jesus will give me what I want. How often do we come to the Lord in prayer trying to sweet talk Jesus in order to get what we really want? We ought not do that. We are to come honestly and with humility, making our needs and our requests and our desires known to our King. We are not to come to him in confession with a sanitized version. Right? When we confess our sins, we ought to not clean ourselves up or try to uh, sanitize how evil our sin is, but we are to come to him honestly, being very real, painfully real, concerning the wickedness of our sin, trusting he can handle it. Our worship of Christ should not be wrapped in our own ego or self-indulgence, but rather to understand worship as a dialogical dance where we are formed by God while at the same time singing praises to him. We ought not view God as the audience and we get to perform for him. In worship, we enter into this dialogue, into this back and forth, and he does a work on us as we sing his praises from our mouths. We must come to Christ, come to God rightly. This really matters. We live in a day where we have such a low view of God that we, we think it doesn't matter at all how we come before the Lord that I can come and I can trick him, I can, I can convince him of what I want, and I can do so in a way that makes me feel good. But this is not true. We are to come into his presence rightly, which is to say we come into his presence as he has called us into his presence, as he has directed us to come into his presence. Hebrews chapter 10 says this, says, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. This is how, with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. How are we to come into the presence of God? With a true heart, trusting in his faithfulness, having full assurance of his, of his um, redeeming blood that has cleansed us and held on to us. Right? This is how we come into his presence honestly. We are to do so with a true heart. We do not come as the hypocrites wearing a mask to cover our shame. We are not to come self-righteously flaunting our good works, trying to conceal our guilt. We don't come as Adam and Eve hiding behind fig leaves of self-sufficiency, thinking that God will not see what's really going on, right? We come into the presence of God completely exposed. And if we come any other way, we're only fooling ourselves, and living a delusional life. Hebrews chapter 4 says this, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. This is true whether we want to believe it or not. Right? Well, you are not hidden from his sight. He knows your heart. He knows your motives better than you do. He knows your character better than you know yourself. Jesus sees right through the Jews' question to the intentions of their heart, and he speaks directly to it. He's not interested in ask, answering the question that they asked. So knowing that Jesus sees all and nothing is hidden from his sight, we ought to ask ourselves this question. When we come before God, do we do so like the Jews with selfish motives in mind? Or more simply, why do you seek Christ? Why do you seek him? Why do you pray for him or pray to him? 
This is a question we really ought to wrestle with because we have the same depraved nature that the character of the Jews have in the Gospel of John. We are very quick to come into his presence with pretense and a covering, thinking that he won't see us for who we are. Why do we come into the presence of God? Selfishly, to make life better. I'm going to pray to God so he makes my life better. Do we come into the presence of God hoping to make our guilty conscience feel better? Like it's really not about Jesus. It actually has everything to do with this weird guilt feeling that I have. So I'll come to church and that will make it ease my pain. How often do we come to Jesus thinking about not so much this life, but really wanting to make sure that our next life is one of beauty and bliss? We kind of view Jesus like the ultimate retirement plan, right? We come to him because he's going to guarantee that this investment works. Or do we come to Jesus seeking him for who he really is? Right? Do we come into his presence because he has captured our hearts and our affections? Do we come to Jesus because we realize that there is no one else who has the words of life? Do we come to Jesus because we search peace and peace is not to be found anywhere other than Christ? Do we come to Jesus because we long to know what is true and we know that truth is nowhere to be found other than Christ? Do we come to Jesus because he is our rest, because he is our joy, because he is our love, because he is our righteousness? Do we come to Christ for who he actually is, the sovereign king over all things, who is redeeming for himself a people by the blood of Christ? And he alone is worthy of all of our praise. Has he grabbed our hearts and our minds and our lives, and do we come to him because there's nowhere else to go? This is how we ought to come to Christ. We are to run after Jesus because of who Jesus actually is, not because we think he will just make us feel better or fill our stomachs with food. These are the questions we need to ask, and we need to ask these questions honestly and not pretend that we don't actually have these checks in our heart and checks in our history, and checks in our motivations, because the one who sees all things sees it clearer than you do. So we come before him honestly. He calls the Jews out on their motivation for looking for him. Again, he says, we, uh, you were not seeking me because you saw signs. That's not the reason. But rather, you are seeking me because you ate your fill of the loaves. You see, the Jews here were so focused on the food that they actually missed the sign, right? They were so focused on just gorging themselves with this food and filling themselves up that they completely missed what this sign, what this miracle actually represented. They were so focused on their own flesh, their own self-indulgence, that they missed the true beauty of what was done. The bread and the fish that Jesus had given to the crowds were signs And they were signs that were meant to lead the eye and the heart and the mind toward the true gift that is Christ himself. The sign was not just to eat bread. The sign was to point everybody to Christ. The signs were to open up their understanding to the fact that right there in front of them is a new exodus taking place, a new Passover taking place, a whole new creation is beginning right in front of them through this sign, yet they completely ignored it. They didn't see it. They were so focused on the food itself. This reminds me of Adam and Eve in the garden. You have these two special, sacred, sacramental trees at the center of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, and they were not allowed to eat of the tree of knowledge, but my goodness, that fruit looked so good. And all they could see was the fruit, and they could think, man, that I have an appetite for this. They missed what that tree actually represented. They missed the sign of the tree. And then being deceived by the serpent, giving them false promises, saying you are greater than you actually are, they took of that tree and they ate it because it was good food. They were so focused on the food that they missed the actual sign. They they missed, they didn't understand what the tree of knowledge was actually there for. 
that this tree was pointing them toward a greater reality. They were so focused on their bellies that they neglected to see the promise that this tree represented. And this promise was this, that at one, at, at one point in their life, someday, they would be able to eat of that tree and they would gain a judicial knowledge. They would be able to discern what is evil, what is good. And in this, they were to be co-heirs with God, taking dominion over the whole earth, determining what is right and wrong, determining what, what is wise and foolish, determining what is true. This is what that tree represented, a judicial knowledge, the ability to rule as kings over the whole earth. It would have been theirs to eat, but they reached out for it too soon before they were ready. They failed to see what God was teaching them and even promising them with the tree of knowledge. So rather than seeing the sign, Adam and Eve selfishly only saw the food. So Jesus, in the next verse, tries to redirect the Jews' affections. He tries to reorder their thinking, help them to see clearly what's going on in their own hearts. And he does so by making this very profound statement. This verse is very, very incredible with what he says. Look at verse 27. Jesus responds to them, or continues saying, he says, do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father has set his seal. This verse is really an incredible verse. In fact, this last week, as I was studying this passage, this verse kept glaring at me. <laughs> it kept looking at me and saying, there's, there's something here, there's something going on here that uh, is not quite easy to see. But there's themes here, there's, there's, there's a pattern here. And when, when studying a passage like this uh, and trying to explain even a difficult verse, uh, one of the best things you want to do is ask questions of the text and then try to answer those questions as clearly and as simply as possible, right? So th this is what I did. I started just asking questions of the text. What is the food that perishes, right? This is the first question that we should ask. Do not work for the food that perishes. What is that? Well, ultimately, it's anything that's not Christ, okay? So what is the food that endures to eternal life? Well, if we look at the context and what comes in chapter 6, we see ultimately that Christ himself is that food that endures for eternal life. Okay, so Jesus, that's how we answer that one. What does he, why does he call himself the Son of Man? It's just another title for Jesus, right? Son of Man. We see this word man, anthropos, all the way back in Genesis with the creation of Adam, that he breathed his spirit, his, in the Greek, his pneuma into the nose of, of, uh, of Adam or into the nose of the anthropos, and he became a living anthropos, right? It's that word. We also see it in Daniel chapter 7, the son of man that ascends into the throne room of God. So this is a fairly loaded term, but it's, just an, it is, it's another title for Jesus. So what does it mean about, about the seal of God? What is this seal? Well, this is a mark of Jesus' divinity, of his anointing, of his calling. It is God's mark upon him as the divine Messiah who was prophesied from the very beginning. Now, these answers help us understand this verse, yet continuing to study it, it felt like I had a couple notes of a song in my mind from this verse, but I couldn't place the tune. You know how that is. You get this little tune stuck in your head. It's like, where is that from? And you're trying to think through it. So continuing to ask these questions, and eventually the song became clear. It's like, oh, I see it. So what I want us to do for the next couple minutes is I want us to swim deeply in this verse. I want us to explore this verse. Um, and as we do so, I want you to imagine with me that Jesus comes to you, the, risen, the crucified and risen Lord, he comes to you, and he takes you by the hand, and he wants to go on a walk with you. And he wants to walk with you through the pages of the Old Testament, showing you around, showing you everything that pertains to him throughout these pages. Okay, Kind of like the disciples on the road to Emmaus experience, when Jesus opens up the scriptures and says, and shows them all the things that pertain to him. Kind of like a John chapter 5, where Jesus says that the law and the prophets, it's all about me. Right, so imagine Jesus himself takes you by the hand and he wants to take you for a walk, a tour through the Old Testament. I think as we do this, 
we will begin to see the beauty of this verse uh, of John 6, 27. So, picture Christ, the second Adam, the son of man, Anthropos, Yahweh himself, taking you by the hand and walking backward through the dark halls of history. He guides us past the prophets, bringing us to Isaiah and Ezekiel, and we look and we see them, and we hear them proclaiming this new creation that is coming. And this new creation will be like a cosmic garden of Eden where the whole world will be transformed into paradise. And there will be a feast at the table of Christ as a glorified people in a glorified creation we will eat with our king. Jesus continues to usher us back to the days of David where we sing and dance our ways through the Psalms, as we hear them afresh as the songs of Christ. He leads us back even further to Moses, bringing us into the tabernacle and showing us around. As he shows us around, he explains how the whole, the whole created order is seen in the very design of the tabernacle and the temple, from the lights in the heavens to the waters in the sea to the trees in the fields to the rocks or to, to the gems and precious stones in the rocks. God's original temple of creation was illustrated in the microcosm that was the tabernacle. He reminds us how he, the Logos, the word, the very word of God, was the one who was spoken, and he brought all things into existence. But not only that, but he reminds us that he, the word of creation, put on flesh and tabernacled among us. As he shows us the tabernacle, he shows us all of creation and the incarnation all wrapping up in him. He guides us through the tabernacle, showing us the altar and the bronze basin. He explains how he is the true sacrifice. He is the one who is offered on the altar of God for our forgiveness. And he is the one who washes us and cleanses us clean of our sins. He brings us to the table of showbread and to the lampstands inside the tent where we see that he is the true bread of life and that he is the light of the world. He then shows us the altar of incense where we see that he is our ascended high priest who prays for us and intercedes on our behalf. He then takes us by the hand, brings us through the curtains into the holy of holies. And there he tells us, that this place where heaven and earth are fused together are pointing to him. He is the true sanctuary. He is where God and man dwell together. He is the true, most holy place. Yet this tour does not end in the tabernacle. Jesus brings us further back in time to the Garden of Eden, and he shows us the gates of the garden on the east side where the cherubim stand with his flaming sword. And we know that for us to try to ascend into this garden of Eden alone, we would, like those sacrificial animals at the tabernacle, be cut into pieces and burnt up by that flaming sword. Yet Jesus, once again, takes us by the hand and walks us past the flaming sword through the entrance to the garden. And at this moment, we recognize the holes in his hands and the scars on his back. For Christ has already been cut up and burnt upon the altar of the cross, where he has sacrificed as our atonement. Jesus is the one and the only one who can walk us through the gates of the garden. For he and he alone bears the seal of God. The seal that states that he is Yahweh in the flesh. He is of the same substance and nature. He is the eternally existing second person of the Trinity. He is the one who speaks this garden into existence, and he is the one who placed the angel at the gate. This is the seal that Christ has upon him. It is the seal of God himself. And when we see Christ for who he really is and realize what he has done, we also realize that Christ has likewise marked us. For he has brought us into himself like one who brings food into the body. And there we have been sealed with the spirit of God. Jesus then walks us to the center of the garden in the cool of the day where we see the two trees Jesus reaches out to take hold of the fruit from the tree of life. He then stretches out his hand toward us and invites us to eat. As we receive the food from his nail-torn hands of the Savior and King, we take a bite and we bring it into ourselves. 
And as we eat this food, we realize that things have changed. As we eat this food, we feel the very life of God rushing through our veins. As we eat this food, we understand that in some mysterious way, we are partaking in the, in the divine nature of God. As we eat this food, we realize that we are feeding on God himself. For Christ is the tree of life. Christ is the food that endures to eternal life. He alone satisfies. He alone fills. He alone gives eternal life. As we eat this food, we realize that every other thing that we have pursued in our lives is nothing, for it all perishes. Every other food has turned to ash in our mouths and has become bitter in our stomachs. For outside of the food of Christ, nothing satisfies, nothing fills, and nothing gives life. Christ then looks at us and says to us, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. The life that we live is to be a life where we set our whole selves, mind, body, and spirit toward the food that endures forever. Our whole life is to be one that pursues this food. It is the one that we are to work for, strive for, long for, desire with every ounce of our being. The life of the Christian is a life that chases after Christ, for he alone gives eternal life. We come to Christ with thanksgiving, for he is both the gift and the gift giver. Right? He is both the food and the food giver. He is both the life and the life giver. He is both our salvation and the one who gives us salvation. He is everything, and he gives everything in that he gives himself to his people. He has taken hold of the fruit of the tree of life, and he offers it to us. And with thanksgiving, we are to receive it, take it into ourselves, and realize that this is Christ. Christ is what the sign of the tree of life was pointing toward. It's all about him. Now, the Jews hear these words from Jesus, and no doubt he is, they are thinking of the Garden of Eden. They are thinking about the tree of life because it is there that they know this is food that endures to eternal life. That's the place, is the tree of life. And in their mind, they want to know, well, how do we get it? But they're not asking Jesus for entrance but rather, they ask Jesus, what do we have to do to earn it? How do we, what do we have to do to work for it? How do, we, how do we get ourselves into that garden once again and eat of that tree? They want the tree of life. They want to eat its fruit. And they want back into the garden. So they ask him in verse 28, what must we do? What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus, you just said, do not work for that which perishes, but work for that food which endures to eternal life. So what is the work that we have to do? What do we have to do? What observances must we keep? What feasts must, must we celebrate? What laws must we obey? What sacrifices must we offer? What works must we do in order to eat of this food that you speak of? Now, most of us in our post-Reformation Protestant uh, theological framework, we want to see a verse like this and say, ah, there it is, legalism, All right? Don't be the legalist. The Jews are a bunch of legalists. All they do is try to earn their way for salvation. They want to know what they have to do to work, to work, to work. And in our post-Reformation Protestant theological framework, we love to separate faith and works as far away as possible so that we don't, like the Jews and like the Catholics, fall into legalism. Right? We want to separate these things as far as possible. However, this is not necessarily a good thing. We love to, sell, we love to separate. However, out of our fear, out of a deep-seated fear of legalism, I think we have neglected to pay attention to actually how close faith and works are linked in the Bible. Okay, so don't hear me wrong. If legalism was a pinata, I'd want to be first in line with a big stick to bash the thing to death, right? 
And then when it falls on the ground, it would just be empty papers anyways, because there's nothing about legalism that is good. Let's see this thing die, slip into the grave, and we can all dance upon the grave, right? That, that, is, that is how we ought to feel about legalism. But the problem is we don't bash and destroy legalism by just separating faith and works. That's not how we do it. We destroy legalism by properly understanding and appropriating faith and works. So if we understand faith and works, we understand that the Bible puts them together very closely to the point where we would say biblically, James, John, other places, even, even in Paul, that faith is a work. Ugh, we don't like that because we're saved by faith, not by work. So how does this work? Well, it doesn't work by separating them. We have to reckon with what the Bible says. Faith is a work. Now, the question that we have to ask is then this. Well, whose work is faith? And this is the question Jesus answers for us in verse 29. He says, Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. This is the work of God that you believe you have faith. This is the word pistis, which is to believe, to have faith, to pledge allegiance to. All of that's wrapped up in this word. This is the work of God that you believe. So we see absolutely faith is a work. It's just not our work. It's God's work. It is God's work. This is why Paul says, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord, because he has done the work. He is the one who does the work of faith. For we are the ones who receive this gift of eternal life by faith, and the faith that we have is a faith that God has worked in us. We ought not separate faith and works. We just need to properly appropriate them. The work of faith belongs to God, and we receive that gift freely. And for us to receive and eat the food that is Christ for eternal life, we do not need to get our teeth and our stomachs, our appetite ready, right? To eat this food, to to, to, to take the fruit that uh, is Christ and bring it into ourselves. We do not need to get our appetite ready. We only believe and we are filled. We only believe and we are filled. It is by faith that we receive Christ. It is by faith that we feast at the tree of life. You see, it is Christ who brings us into the Garden of Eden. He brings us into the Holy of Holies. He brings us into the presence of God. He feeds us. He works in us. He gives us our faith so that we might respond by living our lives in allegiance to him. Church, we must understand that Christ is the one who does everything for our salvation. And because he has done this, and because of who he is, we are to seek him for who he is, unlike the character of the Jews who are seeking him for selfish gain. What do we have to gain when we could serve the one who gives us all things in Christ? There's nothing else out there. Right? There's no scheme, there's no plot, there's no uh, secret desire of things that we can get on the side when we serve Christ, for he is our all in all. He is all that we need. Church, we are to seek this Christ. We are to seek him so our faith might grow stronger as God continues to faithfully work in us. We are to seek Christ and as we, as we do so, we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are to seek Christ as he leads us down the path of righteousness. We are to seek Christ, for he is everything. If you want joy, seek Christ. Joy outside of Christ is not joy. You want peace? Seek Christ, for he is our peace. Hope, it's Christ. Truth, it's Christ. Righteousness, it's Christ. Glory, it's Christ. Everything that we, are been, we have been designed to long for is found in Christ. Not to the side, not beyond him, but in him. We are to pursue Christ, and all of these things will be added unto us. So church, let us with joy feast on the food that is Christ. For apart from him, everything else perishes. But he alone has the words of eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you've done for us in Christ. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son. 
Lord, we thank you that you have brought us to your table as a son, and you have showered your blessings upon us in Christ. Lord, there is no other place where truth is found but in Christ. There's no other place where hope is found but in Christ. God, I pray as we come to your table this morning, we will come with thanksgiving in our heart, longing for you and you alone. For God, you are the bread of life. You are the source of all hope. In your name we pray, amen.